Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're going to be doing part 102 of our Planet Zoom Mod Spotlights. We'll take a look at some of the wonderful mods people have been making and use them to talk about some of the wonderful biodiversity that we share our world with. And um, as you can see here, I've kind of removed a couple of animals that were originally going to be in this because I've been finding ever since like part 70 that... Planet Zoo's been giving me issues when I make those longer videos, so sometimes I've had to re-record them and hope that the video is able to be edited or uploaded onto YouTube. So I've decided that, plus with that, and then the mods are probably going to be a bit slower in the future and things like that, instead of doing your typical 9 mods, I'm going to be just doing your 7. So I think that helps bring the episodes a little shorter, they'll make them more frequent, and I think that is a really good way to keep it shorter so you guys don't have to slog through an hour-long video. But anyway... We're going to be starting off today. We've got a couple crocodilians to start off with. How do you not love your crocodilians? We've got here Smooth Fronted Cayman, or also known as the um, Shining Nose uh, Smooth uh, Fronted Cayman, or just the Dwarf Cayman. Uh, the um, Sunitches, uh, oh, I can't even say it probably. Um, I can't even say it. I'm not going to bother anyway. But anyway, we're going to get started. These guys are a crocodilian from South America, and they are native to the Orinoco and Amazon basins, and they're actually the second smallest member of their family, which is the Alligator Day, since they're a caiman. And um, really cool little guys here. So, and as you can see, they look quite interesting. They're quite similar in appearance in a lot of ways to the Spectacle Cayman. But they have no bony ridge between the eyes. And the scutes on the back and tail, as you can kind of see here, are quite large and really gives them an interesting look. And... Um, they're heavily ossified bone armor down its back as well, and the ventral surface, so down its back and uh, top there, as you can see that there. They also have a relatively short and broad tail, which is actually laterally flattened a lot more than a lot of other came in the crocodilian species. And the bony scoots, as you can see, also have these sideways projections as well. And um, the tail is actually well armored and actually relatively inflexible compared to a lot of other um, croc species. And you can see here their color, there's about dark gray uh, with this kind of brown with mid eyes there. They're not the biggest, as I mentioned, they're the second smallest caiman, uh, second only to the Cuvier's Dwarf Cayman, which is already in the game. These guys can get about 1.7 to 2.3 meters long, or 5 to 7 feet long, but they have been recorded specimens up to 2.6 meters, or about 8 foot 6, with females often staying much smaller. Females don't exceed 1.4 meters, or 4 foot 7. And they are typically, as you can see, quite a robust caiman, and they're quite strong for their size. And they tend to carry their neck around in a higher angle and things like that, which makes them really, really distinct looking. You're going to see here. Really, really cool to see these nice caimans. Anyway, these guys are native to the Amazon and Orinoco basins. They can be found in Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, uh, French Guiana, uh, Peru, Suriname, and uh, Venezuela, where they live in small uh, streams and forested habitats in some cases the water may actually not be deep enough for them to submerge so they're very terrestrial species of crocodilian which is very interesting and um, they're seldom seen in open areas even in captivity so it suggests that they don't even like to go out into the open even with the sun so they're a little bit more secretive which is also very interesting and in terms of their uh, behavior and their life history, these guys typically uh, have quite a cryptic uh, nature and habits, and they're seldom seen during the day, and they actually spend most of their day in underwater uh, water burrows. And they actually may spend much of its time, like up to 100 meters away from a waterway, and concealed in either dense undergrowth or under fallen logs and things like that. Typically, males of the species are territorial, and females will have those smaller home ranges. They're also semi-terrestrial, so they are more often found on land sometimes than a lot of other crocodilians. And they mainly feed on animals such as porcupines, packers, um, snakes, birds, and lizards, consuming a few fish and mollusks, but not very often. And hatchlings, as little young, young younglings, these guys will feed on like insects and other arthropods. But in the first few weeks, they graduate into that larger prey as they grow, which includes small fish, birds, and reptiles. And juvenile mortality, similar to other species of crocodilians, is quite high. Although adults can be hunted by jaguars and things. Typically, once you're an adult, you're typically uh, set for life. You're not very likely to get killed by big things. So, um, yeah, really, really awesome in that regard. Um, as we look at these cute little babies here, in terms of uh, breeding, these guys reach uh, maturity and start breeding at about 11 years of age for females. And males are about 20. 
And the female will typically build a large mound nest out of leaf litter and soil that, um, or they'll often use a pre-existing nest if they can find one and then they lay their eggs in there. They typically lay a clutch of about 10 to 15 and they cover that with further nesting material. Some heat is actually generated from that decaying vegetation that keeps the uh, eggs at a constant temperature. And they often will build their ne uh, nests on the sides of termite, termite mounds because of that metabolic heat generated by the termites often actually keeps the clutch at a constant temperature. The eggs typically need to be incubated at a temperature from 31 to 32 degrees Celsius and uh, for the production of the male offspring, so they have temperature sensitive sex determination, which is pretty interesting. The incubation period for these little guys is about 115 days, and the female caiman will remain near the nest for the at least for the earlier part of this time and provides protection to the nest against predators. And during incubation, uh, roots may grow through the nests and soil from the termite mound may actually cement the eggs together. And this means that parental assistance is sometimes necessary for when the eggs are able to hatch to escape the nest. And then the female in her mouth will kind of carry the babies up to the nearest uh, water source or the nursery area. And the female will then stay with them for a few weeks until they disperse. And then the female may, uh, after that, miss a year or so of breeding before she lays in its clutch so she can recover from that. Which is very very interesting with these cute little guys let's have a look at another adult while we talk about them so in terms of their conservation status they're actually doing pretty well they can see least concern they're not very extensively hunted like other species of caiman because they've got these really large osteoderms on their back which means they're not really prized for leather but they are sometimes collected for the pet trade and the main threat of these uh these guys is typically destruction of forest habitat and pollution by um gold mining activities which pollutes their waterways and things like that though the estimated population is estimated to be about over a million individuals so they seem to be doing pretty well and this is why they're considered least concerned so um yeah they're doing okay for a little caiman really really awesome little guys here so that was done by vincible vincible really does a wonderful job with all the little uh, reptiles and crocodilians that he does i uh, really do love them but uh next we went on to next one by uh Genora Pizza and Brent Triple O Seven, which is pretty awesome. Uh, really nice to see uh, Brent back into the modding scene. We've got a remake of the Tommy Stoma or False Gariel. So these guys are also known as the Malayan Gariel or the Sindu Gariel, but typically called the False, false Gariel. Uh, these guys are quite cool. And you can see here they've got like this dark reddish color to them. It's not really showing it up on this one since it's just an edited ca uh, Gariel. They've got quite a long uh, nose there. Uh, these guys are actually have one of the slimmest faces of any crocodilian, second only to the true gharial. And it's actually more comparable to things such as like the slender slouted crocodile or the freshwater crocodile and their slenderness. Uh, they're also quite um, large. Males can get up to about 5 meters or 16 feet long. Uh, three males were actually kept in captivity that measured 3.6 to 3.9 meters long or 11 to 12 feet and weigh between 190 and 210 kilograms or 420 to 460 pounds while a female weighed three uh, was measured at about 3.27 or 10 foot 9 and weighed 93 kilograms they also have the largest skull of any extent, uh, extent crocodilian because of their long snout which is very interesting and they're one of the eight longest skulls can be found in the museum, and the six of them belong to false gharials, which is also really cool. And um, they're just really cool animals in general. And you can see they've got these dorsal scales going along them. They've got these really short needle-like teeth that allows them to catch fish and things like that. But they, as I mentioned, they have eat a lot more than that, which is really, really awesome. So um, in terms of their distribution and their habitat, uh, these guys are native to Malaysia, um, Sarawak, uh, both the Sumatran and Borneo islands of Indonesia, but have been extirpated from Vietnam, Thailand, and Singapore, which uh, obviously sucks because we want more caimans and uh, want more gharials in the world. I mean, especially the false ones. Even if they are false, they should be real. <laughs> it's unknown if they remain in Java, though, and as part from rivers, they typically live in swamps and lakes. And they're almost entirely found today in peat swamps and lowland forests. And um, as of the 1990s, information and sightings were available of about to 39 locations in 10 different river drainers along the river systems of Borneo. And prior to that, they typically occurred uh, in the past the 1950s, or prior to the 1950s, they lived all across the Sumatran East uh, and the Bajan Mountains. 
though typically that range is greatly decreased because of hunting, logging, fires, and agriculture, which obviously is very not good. Let's have a look at you swimming. In terms of their diet, uh, they were originally thought to be, um, there was, until very recently, we actually didn't know much about their diet in the wild, and it was assumed to be kind of similar to that of a gharial, where these guys would have eaten like fish and very small vertebrates, but more recently shows that these guys have a more generous diet, despite that more narrow snout. In addition to eating these smaller aquatic animals and uh, fish, these guys have been recorded eating things such as proboscis monkeys, uh, long-tailed macaques, deer, water birds, and reptiles. And the immature adults will prey on these guys, so that's very interesting. There's also an eyewitness account of one of these guys attacking a cow in um, each Kalamantan, I believe they say that, so that's very interesting. So instead of being like hypergarial-like, these guys most likely would have been the equivalent to a neotropical crocodile such as the Orinoco or an American crocodile with their quite broad diet. And in terms of their reproduction, these guys are mound nesters, mount, mound nesters. So they typically lay a small clutch of 13 to 35 eggs per nest. Let's see if we can find the babies in here. There they are. So they live in that small clutch, 13 to 35, and they appear to have the largest eggs of any extent crocodilian. And sexual maturity in the females will typically arrive at about 2.5 to 3 meters, or 8 to 9 feet long, which is actually quite large compared to other crocodilians. And it's not known where they breed in the wild or um, when they breed in the wild or where their nesting season is. But once the eggs are laid, uh, the female will kind of make the nest and then abandon them. Because they're actually quite uh, weird among crocodilians as they do not really provide parental care for their babies. And since the babies obviously don't have their parents around, they're at risk of being eaten by predators such as mongooses, tigers, leopards and wild dogs. But once these little uh, guys reach about... 90 days of um, incubation, these guys will hatch, and then they'll be able to leave and fend for themselves. And um, in terms of conflict, there have been some reports of Gariels attacking people. Though, however, by 2012, there's only been two more verified attacks uh, since Gariels, about three. And it's believed that a lot of this conflict could be coming from uh, issues such as um, uh, degradation of habitat, so the animals are becoming more desperate. Things like that, uh, so that's obviously not a good symptom of that, since they're a little bit more desperate. In terms of threats, these guys have also been threatened to extinction because throughout most of its range because of drainage uh, of its freshwater swampland habitats and also the clearing of rainforests. And um, the species hunted frequently for its skin and meat, and the eggs are often harvested for human consumption, which has led them to become uh, vulnerable. And they're not found in a lot of areas where they used to be found in, as I mentioned. And um, their distribution is much more spotty, and there's risks of genetic um, isolation. And um, due to the extreme habitat destruction within the areas, actually there's few areas outside of uh, legal um, protected areas that have gharials in them, so that makes the populations very isolated. And um, steps have been taken by the Malaysian and Indonesian governments to protect them. There are reports of them uh, rebounding in Indonesia with slight recoveries, and mostly irrational fears have been of attacks have it's kind of scared the population, but luckily they're doing okay. So there's been effort to try and reintroduce them and bring them back into uh, uh, areas where they are trying to like bring the numbers back, but they're doing okay. They're only considered vulnerable. There is some serious uh, threats to their uh, existence and also not being able to live in most of the places that they used to, but they're doing okay for the moment. Hopefully there's more conservation work going into those guys. So next up, uh, Brent007 did a wonderful job of that. Next, we're moving on to some monkeys. We got Mega Kebab. This is a remake of the um, Cerberus Crested Macaque, or the Salabesis, I believe you say that. Really wonderful little macaque here. So these guys are really awesome. Also known as the Sulawesi Crest, uh, Crested Macaque, or the Crested Black Macaque, which actually has a quite, uh, quite nice roll off the tongue. These guys are pretty much covered in a black hair except for their hairless face and the white hair on their back and shoulder range except and that and they actually have stunning brown uh black red eyes as well which is pretty is reddish brown eyes which also makes them look very interesting uh they have that long muzzle and these high cheekbones with that characteristic tuff at the top there where they get their name the crested macaque and they also have an ape-like appearance which led to their name the black ape because they have a very short tail that's vestigial probably about two centimeters long and these guys, in terms of their size, are actually quite large. They get about 44 centimeters 
uh, long or about 17 inches and uh, to 60 centimeters or 24 inches in length and weigh up to 3.6 to 10 kilograms or about 8 to 23 pounds. And, but they're actually one of these smaller macaque species, so the, most macaques can get much bigger than this. And they're quite long-lived as well. They can live for about 15 to 20 years in the wild. In terms of their ecology, uh, let's have a look at these wonderful guys here. In terms of their ecology, these guys are diurnal rainforest dwellers, and they are primarily terrestrial, so they spend most of the time on the ground looking for food and socializing, and they search for food and sleep in the trees. Uh, these guys are mainly frugivores, with 70% of their diet being fruits, but they'll also consume leaves, buds, seeds, fungus, small birds, bird eggs, lots of insects and small invertebrates, and occasionally lizards and frogs. So quite generous in that regard. In terms of their group behavior, these guys typically live in groups of 5 to 25 animals, and they can occasionally incur groups up to 75 animals. Smaller groups often have a single adult, but large groups can have up to four adult males, though the males are always outnumbered four to one to the females. So for every large group, there's one male for every four females. Younger males are often forced to leave uh, when they get old enough, and then they'll form either bachelor groups or kind of hang out by themselves. And communication consists of various sounds and gestures, and they often will use, like, a lot of other monkeys when they smile and bore out their big canine teeth. It's like, hey, don't mess with me. It's meant to be threat. So that's why you don't smile at monkeys. And like other species of macaques, they're quite promiscuous with both male and females uh, mating multiple times and multiple partners. The recipity uh, of the females or the receptivity of the females is often clearly indicated on their butt. Uh, let's see if we can find one standing there. Where this butt will kind of bulge out and become swelling. It's called intuberance and they have quite red and bulbous. And that kind of indicates when they are uh, in heat. And once the female is pregnant, she will be uh, gestating for about 174 days. And they usually give birth to a single offspring, like these little guys here, which is obviously really cute. And um, they usually give birth in spring, where food is most plentiful. And the young animals are nursed for approximately a year. And they become fully mature at about three to four years of age, with uh, females somewhat sooner than the males. So this is a really interesting species. Sadly, they are considered critically endangered because most of their habitat, they're not really well protected. Because it devastates crops and fields, these guys are hunted as a pest, and they're also hunted for bushmeat. So clearing of this forest actually threatens their survival. The situation on the small uh, neighboring islands of Sulawesi, such as Bacamas Nysa, is since there's low human populations. The total population of macaques on Sulawesi is about 4,000 to 6,000, while the Bacan Island has up to 100,000 monkeys. So they're doing okay in that area, but obviously um, on Sulawesi they're not doing so hot because of obviously people hunting them and such. There's been a series of surveys trying to find and obviously help with their diversity and things like that. They're both kept in zoos and well sometimes, and they will help breed them as well. And if you guys remember that... Uh, it was a big news story. There was a picture of a Cerberus crested, um, or a Sulawesi crested macaque, with a picture of it, the monkey selfie. And that was actually quite a big uh, debate uh, <laughs> in terms of copyright. It was a very interesting, uh, I think a very interesting discussion, things like that. And cool monkeys that take selfies. I think it's quite cute. And nevertheless, even though they are critically endangered, these guys are actually unprotected outside of the Tankoko Reserve, and they are regularly hunted and slaughtered, and due to this, they are obviously considered uh, critically endangered, and they are easily caught because they have no fear of humans, and they're often considered delicacies, so that's not good for their populations. But yeah, really, really awesome animal. Nice to see these guys all made. Mecha Kebabs always does a wonderful job with the monkeys, and we got another one from him today. We have got the uh, Stubtail Macaque. So really cool guys here, not too different from other types of macaque. So this is the stubtail macaque, also known as the bear macaque. These guys are native to uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia, and um, they occur in those kind of uh, India as well. Quite a widespread animal. Similar to other species of macaque, they're frugivores, but they'll eat many types of vegetation and even small animals. So they'll eat freshwater crabs, seeds, leaves, roots, bird eggs, insects, and frogs, pretty much whatever they can get their mouths around. In terms of their description and their how they look, as you can see, they have quite a long, thick fur, which helps give their name kind of like the um, bear macaque. That measures between 32 and 69 millimeters in length, uh, which uh, but their tail is hairless and things like that, and their short tail. Infants are typically born uh, 
white and then they darken as they grow older and at this age their bright pink and red faces will come dark brown and things like that um, the males are typically quite a bit larger than the females males will typically measure about 51 to 65 centimeters or 20 to 25 inches long and weigh between 9.7 to 10 kilograms or 21 to 22 pounds or females get about 48 to 58 centimeters or 19 to 23 inches and weigh between 75.9.1 kilograms and similar to other species of macaques the canine teeth which are quite important for establishing the dominance within their social groups um, are more elongated than those of the females so that basically allows them to better display this is fine one hanging out down here so, and um like all macaques they actually have cheek pouches which allow them to store uh, food in their mouths for a short period of time so they can pick it up and run away with it which is quite interesting in terms of their habitat these guys uh, often travel quad uh, quadrupedally usually on the ground and they're not as agile in trees as a lot of other monkeys and they, they though they can be typically found in evergreen tropical and subtropical broadleaf forests and pretty much any types of forests really it depends on rainforests for food and shelter, and they're not really found in dry areas except when the Himalayan um, region of uh, India, only spending, uh, spending time in secondary forests and things like that. With its thick fur, they can actually live in quite cool climates. Uh, they can live in elevations of up to 4,000 meters or 13,000 feet, and they're distributed from northeastern India to southern China, down into western Malaysia and the Malay Peninsula. They've also found in Burma, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, and possibly extinct in Bangladesh. Uh, no global population estimate exists, but there in Cambodia, there's believed to be a declining population of 230 in um, the Kiesamono Wildlife Sanctuary. And there's also a study population, which we actually know a lot of these guys are from. So introduced into Lake um, Canamaco, I believe you say that, in Mexico, where they live in kind of semi-natural conditions. And actually most information that's studied about these stubtail macaques are actually um, from this introduced population. And there's been few long-term studies on the native uh, populations in their home range, which is very interesting. So in terms of their uh, social structure, not too different from a lot of other macaques. They have a linear do uh, dominance hierarchy, obviously with males and females. Uh, and the males typically the boss and they have different ranking for males and females, things like that. But what makes them different from a lot of other macaque species is that they typically are much more pacifist. And they use a high degree of pacifism and ha uh, harmony in their troops. And they actually use their repertoire of resiliation tactics. So they are able to come up with a lot of different behaviors and a lot of different ways to try and um, try and uh, dissolve conflict and things like that. These species as well, they typically don't have long lasting pair bonds like other species of macaque and they're truly promiscuous. And when physical violence occurs very rarely and though but though minor scrapes often flare up with physical intimidation things, they tend to be quickly resolved, and this resulting in the species often being peaceful. Dubba macaques are actually remarkably unfussy in their eating habits, and um, being quite large and bulky, these guys are actually quite mobile on land, but quite ungainly in trees, which is actually quite unique for a lot of um, macaques. These guys are quite big and uh, bulky for these guys. And um, let's have a look at the babies while we talk about them. And... It, it allows them to consume larger quantities of meat as well. So these guys tend to be a little bit more predatory. And this allows them to eat things like insects, small animals, and eggs, and allows them to hunt them. In terms of reproduction, there's been a lot of research into their, um, their kind of hormones. And a study population of female macaques showed that they have increased steroid uh, sex hormones of things like um, progesterone. Uh, they're significantly greater during the summer and fall, and uh, progesterone levels are simply greater during summer, fall, or winter. So this shows that these guys um, have two mating seasons a year. So typically they'll have a summer breeding season from July to August, and one in fall, November. And this is um, supported by the distribution of re uh, birth frequencies within stuffed-tail macaques. So um, very interesting in that regard. And you can see uh, the little baby here. So uh, they're born, as I mentioned, quite light and then they get darker as they age and as they become adults which is very very interesting this must be a male really awesome really really awesome a nice mod mega kebab really did a wonderful job with that one so next moving on to another cool animal uh we have got by leaf mark and sub cdc we've got the zebra diker 
another cool guy here. So these are a small antelope that are typically found in Libya as well as the Ivory Coast, Sierra Leone, and Guyana. Um, they're often called the banded or striped back diker, which is very interesting. And you can see here, these guys are quite small. They have a gold to reddish brown coat with these 12 to 16 distinct stripes on them. And they typically have markings, uh, dark markings on the upper leg and uh, around their ankles and things like that. And um, newborns appear darker than they are born and then the stripes close together. It's, that one's not quite a newborn though. Uh, as adults, they can get up to about 90 centimeters or 35 inches in length, about 45 centimeters tall and about 20 kilograms or 44 pounds in weight. As you can see, the horns are also quite short and round with those little pointy tips, uh, but they can get up to about 4 to 5, 4.5 to 5 centimeters long in males and about half that in females. So males typically have a little bit bigger one. So let's see if you can find the male. Must be over here. Typically the male has a slightly larger horns but though female body size tends to be a little bit larger than the female uh, larger than the males due to the long gestation period so they're bigger to bear bigger babies so the females are slightly bigger which is pretty interesting in terms of these guys habitat they live in low primary rainforest and they like hanging around clearings and along forest margins but they're most commonly found in forest areas in the midwestern parts of africa and they can be commonly found in hills and low mountain um, forests, but less commonly. Um, in terms of their diet, these guys are ruminants, and they will feed primarily on fruits, foliage, and seeds. Though rare, there actually is evidence that these guys eat rodents on occasion, and they actually have reinforced nasal bones that allow them to crack uh, open the harder exteriors of certain fruits that allows them to get to that. So really, really interesting little evolution they have. In terms of reproduction, as we look at the cute little babies here, in terms of reproduction, look at this little cutie, little man. In terms of reproduction, the gestation period is typically between 221 and 229 days, and the female is typically receptive to mating after 10 days after that, after being born, and the mother will only give birth to one calf at a time. A newborn calf will be about 1.2 to 1.5 kilograms at birth, and during the first 10 days of birth, referred as the lactation period, these actually babies will grow about 94 grams a day, though it decreases considerably after the last first 10 days. Uh, females will reach sexual maturity at about 9 to 12 months of age, and females, uh, males will reach sexual maturity at about 12 to 18 months. And they're actually one of the um, really cool, interesting species of um, diker, and they've often displayed stern, uh diurnal activity and living in captivity so in captivity they come up during the day but in the wild they're mostly nocturnal they're also solitary uh, apart for pairs that pair up for obviously breeding purposes or uh, mother and calf pairings both the male and females actually def uh, participate in the defense of young and home ranges and the adaptions include the stripes and the thick and nasal frontal bones. And the stripes are actually uh, may reduce injury to the more vulnerable parts of the um, abdominal area. And they also may actually break the outline of the animal in the uh, undergrowth, so it actually helps with camouflage. And their nasal bones allow for protection against blunt force uh, drama when they fight. So it's a little bit more reinforced. Uh, in terms of their economic importance, they're hunted for their bushmeat, and they often their hides are often uh, used for pe by people as well, which has led to their conservation status of vulnerable. And this is due to deforestation, loss of habitat, and overhunting within its range. And um, zebra dikers are often considered common prey for African golden cats, leopards, pythons, and crowned eagles. And they've been described as the species least capable to actually um, adapt to. Um, uh, to these changes and actually become extinct, most likely, uh, most likely to become extinct. And the wild is estimated to be about uh, 28,000 individuals, so the estimation is believed to be high and there may actually be a lot less, though they do, uh, ha were once more widespread, they can be now commonly found in protected areas, but there needs to be more study looking into them and see what they need in terms of their conservation, and that's why they're considered vulnerable. But yeah, really, really cool animal, do love these guys. So that was done by Leaf, Mark, and Sid, Sib, CDC. Next, we have an uh, older mod that's come back and been remastered and given a new species. We've got the Tarkin here, but done by Leaf and Nicholas Lion Rider. These guys are considered a subspecies or species of Tarkin, depending on who you ask. Uh, really, really interesting. They can be distinguished by um, the Golden Tarkin, uh, the close cousin, by their coat and other morphological differences. 
And believe it or not, Tarkins were used to, since they look quite similar to muskox, they were believed to be closely related. But turns out these guys, the reason they look so similar is because of convergent evolution. And it's actually believed to be these guys are more closely related to various sheep species, such as uh, tars, goats, and barbary sheep, for example. In terms of these guys' habitat, they typically inhabit the same dense bamboo forests that giant pandas live in. And they live in dense thickets and bamboo groves and family groups that could be up to 30 individuals. Despite being large, stocky, and slow moving, these guys are actually quite maneuverable and rocky habitats. And it can often be found on steep and challenging slopes. And because of this accessibility of the uh, habitat, they often, there's not that much information about these guys' behavior and ecology, which kind of sucks. But these guys are still really, really cool. They have all sorts of cool adaptations to help them stay warm in the cooler habitats. They actually have a thick secondary coat and um, to keep them chill, to keep out the chill. They also have a large moose-like moose -like snout, which uh, warms up the air they take in before it goes into lungs. Uh, they also have no skin glands, and their skin actually secretes um, an oily uh, substance on their guard hairs, which acts as a natural uh, raincoat, so they don't get wet, which means they don't suck out the heat, which is really, really interesting. In Tarkin, typically... Eat in the early morning and again late afternoon, but they rest when they're not feeding. So they live in higher altitudes. They feed on many kinds of alpine and uh, deciduous plants and evergreens. And when it comes to food, Tarkins eat pretty much any vegetation within reach. And this includes the tough leaves of evergreen, rhododendrons and oaks and willows and pines, things like that. And they can also easily stand up on their hind legs and be propped against a tree and get high vegetation if they need. So in terms of uh, herding and migration, uh, each spring, uh, Tarkins actually gather in large herds and migrate up the mountains to the tree line. And as cooler weather approaches, they move down into the forest the valleys. As they move up and down, they create uh, tracks and stuff uh, and worn paths through the undergrowth of the bamboo and the rhododendrons that lead up to their salt licks and also their grazing areas. The size of a Tarkin herd as well will change to different seasons. And during the early summer and spring, herds can be up to 300 animals. But during cooler months when there's less food, these guys will live in groups up to about 10 to 35 Tarkins before they head down. And herds are typically made up of sub-adult and young males, uh, adult females, which are called cows, and their kids, which are the young. Uh, but older males, which are the bulls, they typically are solitary until uh, the rut season or the mating season in the late summer where they come and compete for females. And as we talk about kids, look at these cute little guys. So these cows will give birth to a single kid uh, each in early spring. And within three days of birth, the baby's actually quite easily able to follow its mother. And, um, though, and actually through most types of terrains as well. And this is actually very important because if the baby uh, gets left behind, could be eaten by predators and things like that. And in terms of their predators... Um, they have large, powerful bodies and impressive horns, which means they're pretty much invulnerable to most things. But uh, they have natural enemies or predators such as bears and wolves. And they are generally quite slow moving, but they can react quickly and charge when frightened. Uh, when they need to, they can leap nimbly from rock to rock to avoid danger. And when they sense danger, they let out a loud cough to kind of let others know. And they also will make an intimidating roar or bellow to kind of uh, intimidate you and kind of scare you which is uh, obviously quite uh, dangerous. And um, in terms of the conservation, these guys are vulnerable because of a few things, but we'll get into that. They are considered a national treasure by the Chinese government, and they have the highest level of protection, though they are threatened by habitat degradation and poaching. And the highest need for this species is further scientific knowledge to allow uh, production of like long-term conservation and management plans, just because we don't know that much about them. But the principal uh, threat to these guys' survival is poaching by hunters and fur, which has led to a decline in the wild. But these guys actually may have benefited a lot from the extra protections and protected habitat that have gone to protecting giant pandas, since these guys share a similar habitat. And that's very interesting, I think. It really shows how conservation works like that. And um, sometimes when you protect something, it and protect a lot of other species as well and the Tarkin is kind of protected as well by the protection of habitats for giant pandas which is really really awesome so that was done by Leaf and Nicholas Lionrider really really awesome to see that and last but most certainly not least we have got here the Serval by Gaboy and Genora Pizza really really wonderful how it came out look at these wonderful guys here 
So this is a serval. These guys are a wild cat that is native to Africa. Though they're raw, raw, uh, not raw, rare in northern Africa and the Sahel. These guys can be found in a lot, a lot of areas in sub-Saharan Africa. And they're one of the sole members of their genus, um, Lepaturus. And um, they are a medium-sized cat, uh, quite slender as well. They stand about 54 to 62 centimeters or 21 to 24 inches high at the shoulder. And they weigh between 8 to 18 kilograms uh, or 18 to 40 pounds. But females will often tend to be lighter, and they have a head to body length typically between 67 and 100 centimeters, or 26 to 39 inches, with males typically being sturdier than the females. They also have quite prominent features such as the smaller head, the large ears, the spotted or striped coat with these long legs and a back tip tail that gets about 30 centimeters long, or 12 inches long. They also have the longest legs proportionally out of any cat, due to their greatly elongated metatarsal bone in their feet. And they have toes that are elongated as well and actually mobile, which allows them to catch food. It's very interesting. In terms of their color, you can see the golden yellow to uh, bluff colors you can kind of see there. And um, they have these marked spots going down them and also sometimes stripes as well, which show great variation. Uh, facial features include their kind of whitish chin, the spots and streaks, and also they have a lighter underbelly as well, which has fluffy fur and soft guard hairs that can get up to like 5 to 10 centimeters long. Uh, they have, also have long guard heads along the neck and the flanks, which can get up to about a centimeter or so on the face. So make sure they've got quite a decent coat, which is really interesting. And like other cats, they have quite good sense of smell and hearing. And they have been melanistic and leucistic, or kind of pale or black individuals observed in captivity. But in the wild, they have been me melanistic and visual seen, but often they are considered um, quite rare. So in terms of their habitat, these guys are only found in Morocco, but have been reintroduced into Tunisia and are feared extinct in Algeria. But they they do occur in Sahel, and they're also quite common in uh, southern Africa, where they live in grasslands and moorlands and bamboo thickets up to about 3,800 meters or 12,000 feet on Mount Kilimanjaro. But they prefer areas close to water around wetland savanna habitats, which provide cover, which is pretty interesting. And in terms of their behavior and ecology, they tend to uh, are active during the day as well as night, so they just come out when they want, that their activity peaks around early morning and twilight and midnight. And servals may actually be active for a longer amount of time on cooler and rainy days, and when they, but during the mid, hot mid days, they tend to groom themselves and things like that. Uh, they tend to remain cautious because there's lots of larger predators around, but they will be less cautious or less alert when there's um, large carnivores or prey animals around, which is pretty interesting. Uh, servals will often use uh, special tracks to reach their hunting areas and um, they're quite solitary. There's a little interaction between other servals other than mating pairs or um, mothers and babies. The only long-lasting bond is their bond between the mother and her kittens, which typically is only about a year which is when they leave her. They also, like other species of cats, will establish home ranges and they're mostly active only in these certain regions within them. Uh, the areas of these ranges can vary from 10 to 32 square kilometers or 4 to 12 square miles, but that depends on prey density and a lot of other factors. And um, they might overlap extensively, but they don't actually show much aggression towards each other. And sometimes they'll avoid a fight uh, and they'll avoid one another if they can. But on occasions when they do, they'll have a ritualistic display where they pour at the other's chest and kind of try and avoid having a fight. And often this antagonistic behavior includes like moving the head, raising the hair and tail and displaying their teeth and things like that, hissing and things like that. But they are also vulnerable to things such as hyenas and African wild dogs, but they'll seek cover to escape their view. And they're actually quite good climbers and good leapers. As I'll mention, I'll talk about how good they are at leaping. Um, they're quite efficient and a frequent climber, the not frequent climber, I mean. An individual will actually be observed in a tree that's been more than nine meters tall to escape a dog or oh, well, escape dogs and like other species of cats they can purr and all that very interestingly so in terms of their hunting and diet these guys are typically uh prey on rodents particularly like veil rats small birds frogs insects and reptiles though up to 90 percent of their diet is kind of rodents but they will also eat larger prey such as dirkas, hares, flamingos, and young antelopes. But their main diet is typically like grass rats, pygmy mice, and multi mammulate mouse mice. They will typically use their strong uh, sense of hearing and they remain motionless for up to 15 minutes to hunt their prey. 
They're able to jump up to four feet in the air or four meters or 13 feet high in the air with their front paws. And to kill small prey, they'll stalk it and then pounce it on their forelimbs and kind of scratch it out and then bite it as soon as they can. Basically pin it down and bite it. And with animals such as snakes, they'll even bite them anymore and even consume them if they're uh, still moving. Larger prey though, they'll actually kill with a sprint and leap on them and catch them and eat them slowly. And they've actually been seen caching their food if they eat larger prey. They'll cache it and hide it so they can come back and eat it later, which is also very interesting. And during a leap, these guys can actually get to about 2 meters tall uh, in height in terms of their leap, or about 6 feet. And they can cover a horizontal distance of about 11 feet or 3.6 meters and in a large jump. And they actually appear to be quite efficient hunters. Uh, Mother Serval has actually been able to have a success rate of about 62% in her kills. And they average a number of about 12... Uh, 15 to 16 kills uh, in a 24-hour period, but they will scavenge sometimes, though, really. In terms of reproduction, these guys get reach sexual maturity at about uh, 1 to 2 years of age. Estrus and females last about 1 to 4 days. It typically occurs once or twice a year, though they can occur 3 to 4 times a year, depending if the mother loses her cubs. Um, observation of captive shovels, so when they get this estrus, they'll mark urine and do that, you know, all that, what they do with cats do. And gestation, once she gets pregnant, uh, she will uh, be pregnant for two to three months. And following that, there'll be a litter of one to four kittens born. And they'll be born in a secluded area. Uh, an example, they'll be finding burrows or even burrows that have been abandoned by uh, aardvarks or porcupines. They're typically blind at birth and weigh about 250 grams. As we do that, we'll have a look at this cute little baby here. Cute little baby boy. Anyway, um, they'll have soft woolly hair and unclear markings, but their eyes will open at about 9 to 13 days of age. Winnie will begin about a month after birth, where the mother will bring small kills to her kittens and call them when she's approaching the den. Then uh, the mother will um, feed the young kittens, uh, rest with the lung, uh, young kittens actually a noticeably lesser amount of time and spend most of her time hunting. And then when she reaches about 6 months of age, these little babies uh, will get their permanent canines and begin to hunt by themselves, and they typically leave their mother at about 12 months of age, though they actually reach sexual maturity between 12 and 25 months of age. And they're quite long-lived. They get it lived to about 10 uh, years in the wild and up to 20 years in captivity. So in terms of their conservation, as there are considered least concerned because they're quite widespread and live in several protected areas. They're uh, protected from hunting, and there's hunting regulations in most countries that they live in, such as uh, Algeria, Botswana, Burkina Faso, um, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Sierra Leone, Somalia, places like that. They're typically either protected or there's regulations. But the biggest threat to these guys are the degradation of their wetland and savanna habitats. Also, trades of skins are thought to... Uh, cause declines in some countries, and in West Africa, they're actually quite significant to traditional medicines, and pastoralists will often kill servals to protect their livestock, even though they don't really hunt any livestock, which obviously is um, not good, but overall, they're doing okay, they are considered least concerned, and um, yeah, really, really awesome, so Gaboy and General Pizza really did a wonderful job with these guys, I think um, Gaboy has really done a wonderful job selling off these wonderful animals. So I'll end with you here. Look at this wonderful good guy. Nice to see some nice mods coming out. So um, I think this will be a great place to end the video. So I uh, really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. Um, always remember to get the little bell icon to get notified of anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye-bye.